Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John, and a quick PSA regarding my new virtual men's group that meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Pacific time. There's only a few spots left, but I thought you might want to know about it. It's a quick, easy, and cheap way to work with me. And maybe some of you have a career. Maybe you've made some money. Maybe you have a reputation for yourself at work. But maybe what you lack is things like happiness or purpose, a fulfilling relationship or a healthy sex life, the passion, happiness, and ease that you once had with your spouse, an emotion other than numbness, disconnection, or irritability. This group is for men who are trying to be values-driven, interested in lifelong learning, and curious about how to become the best possible versions of themselves. The group is not for men who want to remain in the comfort zone while sitting at home watching TV. So again, group meets weekly, Wednesday, 7 p.m. It's only $95 per session, and you can call 510-863-0057 for more details. That's 510-863-0057. Five, seven. And now on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John back with the latest episode of the Evolved Caveman. And from the book, Reinventing Masculinity, in a recent 538 poll, 60% of men surveyed said society puts pressure on men to behave in a way that is unhealthy or bad. Men account for 80% of suicides in the US and three in 10 American men have suffered from depression. Ed Adams, and Ed Frauenheim say a big part of the problem is a model of masculinity that's become outmoded and even dangerous to both men and women. The conventional notion of what it means to be a man, what Adams and Frauenheim called confined masculinity, traps men in an emotional straitjacket, steers them towards selfishness, misogyny, and violence, and severely limits their possibilities. As an antidote, they propose a new paradigm, liberating masculinity, building on traditional masculine roles like the protector and provider, expanding men's options to include caring, collaboration, emotional expressivity, an inclusive spirit, and environmental stewardship. So today I'm thrilled to have with me Ed Frauenheim. Ed was Senior Director of Content at Great Place to Work, the research organization behind Fortune 100, or Fortune's 100 Best Companies to Work For list. And he has written or co-written articles for Fortune, Inc., and Wired, and is the co-author of three books. Ed, how are you doing? I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm doing well, John. Thanks very much for having me. Um, Yeah, we met recently. And uh, for those of you listening, I I professed my love to Ed quite quickly for me, you know, within (laughs) minutes. Um, It was very odd and liberating. So, so Ed, tell me, tell us your story. Like, how did you get to the point of writing a book on reinventing masculinity? Sure, John. My story is one of struggling to be a guy. In a lot of ways. Uh, and I, I, I need to put that caveat on these days, which I want to put on that I, I had, a, in a lot of ways, pretty easy growing up. I was a middle class, white guy, cisgender, heterosexual, um, growing up in a suburb outside of Buffalo, New York, um, and still faced all these pressures that a lot of us guys had growing up. I'm 55 now to be, you know, great at sports, super strong, ladies' man, uh, win. Uh, in, in different areas of life, um, and also to be, you know, that tough guy, you know, super stoic. I was skinny, I was sensitive, insecure, and I was thwarted with, with all my sports championship games. Uh, I tied in a hockey game when I was 12, and I felt like I was the one who, you know, cost the team a win. I didn't win my, my college uh, intramurals championships in hockey or in ultimate frisbee. And then my teams were losing like crazy. The Buffalo Bills lost four Super Bowls in a row, John. And uh, the Knicks couldn't get past the Bulls. All that, it it sounds trivial, but it all kind of weighed on me, you know. And I I know that there's been some other writing about people and and these adolescent moments that can be really powerful. That was powerful for me. And as I got into the career stage, I did fine. I'm a writer, a lot of books, as you mentioned, and, you know, made a middle-class living. But I never managed anyone from, I managed one person for one day. I may have the smallest management career in history. <laughs> and I never got 
you know, to the Pulitzer Prize level of, of articles and that sort of thing as a journalist. Um, and all that to say, I found a, a way to feel more whole as, as I reflected on these masculine pressures we hate, we, we face that ultimately, you know, through personal writing and then also seeing that in the workplace where I studied work issues and, and leadership, I saw men are called to show up differently. It doesn't, it's not successful to be that barking boss, that kind of cold me first guy anymore. And that's how, uh, you know, when I, Ed and I talk about like two Eds being better than one. And uh, he brought the <laughs> psychological perspective, which I know you have, John. And then I brought the workplace perspective. And we both had these personal stories. And that's what led us to our book, um, Reinventing Masculinity. And it's uh, been neat to see that it's making some kind of an impact on folks and, and giving guys permission to, to think more broadly about how to be a guy. Yeah. And, and I love those of us out there that are giving men permission to be full spectrum to embrace their full spectrum humanity. Like, I, I think exactly. I like the idea that we're human before we're male. And, you know, like we feel things, even though we don't yes, want we to. Do. Exactly. Um, so let me, I, God, there's a bunch of ways I can go with this. So one of the things I wanted to touch on was your time at Great Places to Work. Mm -hmm. um, and what did you see in terms of, because you mentioned kind of what I consider command and control style leadership, the traditional yeah. style leadership. It's yeah. you know, kind of paramilitary. It's hierarchical. It's fear-driven, intimidation-driven. Um, what did you see in terms of great places to work and any correlation to that type of leadership? We saw that the opposite almost type of leadership is what's succeeding today. We did a study uh, a couple of years ago looking at 75,000 employees and 10,000 managers. Wow. And we, we found that the most productive and inclusive leaders were what we called ended up calling for all leaders. And that was a ref reference to the fact that almost everyone on their teams had a great experience. They also had the highest levels of innovation, uh, productivity, um, retention, all these kind of markers for what you want on business results. And what these folks looked like were qualities that do not show up in that kind of old style leadership command and control stuff. Instead, these are folks that build bonds of trust they were really great relationship developers. They were purpose oriented. Uh, the, and that, by that, I mean the big picture purpose, not necessarily the quarterly results, but what is the highest mission of our organization? They also were humble. They tended to make space for their people to show up and get the attention and to not take credit for the, the accomplishments of their teams. And so when we put, I love, we created an icon for this, John, that I loved. It was a woman. So it was a woman sitting down with a, her hand holding a rainbow. And it was like the exact opposite of like, you know, that take charge guy who yeah. was maybe like barking an order. Like the rainbow was kind of reflecting the idea of the, what's the purpose or, or, you know, our, the gold we're seeking at the end of the rainbow. And, and in fact, they did get the gold because that's what people are drawn to now is that kind of um, warm leader, the psychologically safe oriented leader, uh, the leader that's going to be about purpose. Well, we know that from the Google study that psychological safety is the number one driver of effective teams. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that court, we, we had very similar findings. We separately, we found that the most, uh, the, the small businesses that had a caring community outpaced the revenue of their peers. And at first I had to fight to get that research published on because a great place to work. We even weren't sure we could say that because it sounded so soft, you know, yeah. and like, but this is what the numbers showed. Like we're, we're dealing with hundreds of companies and data points. And that was the most significant driver of revenue outperformance was whether people felt like they were in a caring community. When I think, you know, at some level, we all want to be seen, heard and validated and we all want to feel safe. And, you know, if you think of psychological safety, driving productivity, what's the number one thing that undermines safety, psychological safety, I would say it's negative emotions, primarily anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, one, th a line that I, we used in our book, I think was, um, caring rather than scaring produces the best results today. Yeah. Um, and that is, that requires guys to show up differently. You know, we, we, whereas before, even if they weren't scaring people, still guys tended to have kind of a, that their armor up, right. And, and oh, yeah. not, not going to be vulnerable and not going to, you never can cry. Um, but if you're going to create psychological safety as a leader, you've got to go first. Mm -hmm. You've got to be the one who said, I'm not actually struggling today because I had a big tax surprise, yeah. you know, and I'm worried about you my give permission. You got to give permission. You got to model that. Exactly. 
Um, and so if guys are showing up that older way, they come across as rigid, cold, and isolated in a world that's really now calling for flexibility, warmth, and connection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, I think it's one of my biggest struggles as a coach is some of these old command and control style CEOs that for a, any number of reasons just can't seem to see the damage they're creating in their workforce. Mm. What do you think is behind that? I, I, that's a fascinating observation. Well, that there's blindness I, I, there. I think, well, I think lack of self-awareness is the foundation. Um, I, you know, I'm a big fan of Tasha Urich's work that says 95% of us will self-report being highly self-aware and the actual number seems to be somewhere between 10 and 15%. Wow. All right. I didn't know that statistic. Um, and I, I think well, a lot I'm of I'm going to check my own refer- reference points there to it. Okay. <laughs> I call myself self-aware. I'm probably, I might not be in that category. Um, yeah, well then, then you kind of, you hear that and you're like, oh shit, where am I? Which am I? Right, right. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't really matter where you start. It just matters that you become aware and start working on it to get better at it. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the big problems is that whole man box socialization process where I would argue we're left with only three things that we can publicly display without fear of humiliation, which are lust, stress, and the big one, anger. Mm-hmm. And so all of our emotions almost get funneled through that anger lens. And I would say a a big part of these CEOs that's motivating them is abject fear and terror, but it comes out as anger and irritability. Mm -hmm. They're so scared of not achieving or not living up to what they think they should be doing or letting people down or letting the investors down, whatever it is, letting their dads down. If you know, dad was an owner before them. Um, and, and it just comes out as this, awful irritability and anger where they're just barking at people and creating psychological terror, intimidation, fear, anxiety, stress, stifling creativity and innovation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think you're really onto it when you talk about the, those three sanctioned uh, expressions or emotions and all the ones that aren't, um, cause I was going to, I posit something similar to what you said about why aren't these guys seeing the impact. And, and, and I, I was thinking it has something to do with not knowing what those feelings are themselves, right? Because they don't let themselves feel, oh my God, I feel like a little bit empty or, or I feel sad that I'm not making a big, a better difference in the world, say, or, or frustrated that something isn't working or even joy, you know, the, the, the yeah. other flip side of like the, the beauty of, of stuff or the beauty of teamwork. Yeah. Um, I've been playing around with a little phrase of like, I, I want to help guys feel, reveal and heal. Uh, because I think there's so much that is not felt. Yeah. And I'm still st- working on this, even though I, you know, I know what the medicine is supposed to be, but yeah. it's still hard to, to let the, the guard down. Well, and I think it's still scary at times. It is for me. I, I'm still working on it. I've been working on it for 30 plus years. Um, but I think, you know, with that anger, I think we're really addicted to anger as men, men in positions of power in particular. Yeah. And the problem with anger is I externalize all blame onto you when I'm really angry at you. And so if I'm doing that, I have no accountability. I have nothing I need to look at it myself. If you would just stop being such a lazy sack of whatever, I wouldn't be so angry. Then I'd, then I'd be okay. Yeah. Instead of what's my part in this drama? What am I doing to contribute? What is this? What's, it's a co-creation. Yeah. What's my responsibility? I, cop, I love that, John. And, and I'll cop to, I went to an anger management class maybe five, seven years ago. Um, it's because I was trying to get my daughter to go to an anger management class. She's like, dad, you have a bad temper. You should go. I'm like, okay, fine. I will go. You know, I was trying to like, you know, role model that. And I actually learned so much. I I think we should all go to one. I was in, in this class at Kaiser Permanente, our, my healthcare system with a really diverse group of people. Some folks that are dealing with jail issues, you know, and, and, um, you, I think I heard you talk about this with Alex, uh, on, on one of your other podcasts, like anger is, as a cover for either sadness or fear. Uh, maybe there's other stuff in there too, Field but shame. I, yeah. Embarrassment that what I really took away is like, so often for me, at least anger was about fearing for the the safety of my kids, or it was um, that I was just sad, you know, and, and I, it, it, I couldn't register that emotion really well. Yeah. yeah and, and so I think, you know, to your question of why do they do that? I think that's part of it. I think there's other little things around the edges, but I think to me, that's some of the biggest explanation. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this, going back to great places to work. 
one of the things you spoke of when we spoke earlier in our first conversation is this idea of different sort of colored levels being applied to human consciousness, a la Ken Wilber, but mm-hmm. then you guys applied those to organizations. Can you go into that yeah. a little bit? Because that was fascinating to me. Yeah, thanks for that invitation. Because I can't even I can't even understand Ken Wilber. Um, yeah, I I have not made it through a ton of his stuff, but I I, I do appreciate uh, some of the the overall theories. And then the the fellow the author that really uh, moved me and applied a lot of Wilbur's theories is named Frederick Lalu, and he wrote a book called Reinventing Organizations. And he talked about how we're at this next stage of human consciousness uh, called teal consciousness, and organizations are taking this form. So we talk about teal organizations and that teal is a color that comes after a progression of colors that correspond to human uh, levels of basically awareness, starting with red, which is very kind of angry uh, gangland gang type warfare stuff. And then see, there you go. Red anger at the bottom. There you go. It it almost fits your colors from uh, inside out, John. Uh, But Amber is, is like more authoritarian, like a church or a a university that's very structured and, and, and rigid. Then comes orange, which is a more kind of capitalistic or focused on performance and achievement, innovation. Green is, is kind of the DEI world of, okay, well, let's actually include more voices. Um, But the teal one is, is shaped by, um, kind of an acceptance of all the other levels for one thing. And it's a, you really could call it leading to soulful organizations where we're, we're allowed to bring our whole person and, and to see the world in a more holistic connection. They also are characterized by uh, democracy and, and much more shared decision-making and an evolving sense of purpose so that you're listening to like the spirit of the organization. So it can sound a little woo woo, you know, um, mm-hmm. but I, I found that I was really drawn to this and and in part because Lalu talks about the need to unite the feminine and masculine energies and archetypes. And that we, for 10,000 years, maybe since the dawn of agriculture, have leaned on a hyper masculine side of things where we're, we're ignoring the connectivity, the compassion, the receptivity, the, just the being as opposed to the doing and the uh, the kind of aggressive and and purposefulness of, of masculinity, which can be fine in balance, but we've been out of balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that explanation because I, I, it's one of the things I argue for is the marrying of masculine and feminine energies. And you know, to me, it's really about like because I get guys push back on that, right? They're like, "Well, you know, I don't want to be feminine. Like, I want to be a, I want to be a man." You know, like, and their yeah. fear comes up, and I get that. And I'm like, and I actually had someone ask me in an interview, like, well, it seems to me like you're arguing for the wussification of men. Like you haven't been listening Mm -hmm. because what I'm arguing for is to give men full access to their complete humanity, whether it's masculine or feminine, if we can just kind of throw those labels out, that'd be great. And just let them be human and then bring the best parts of themselves to whatever the context is that they're in. So different context, different needs. If you're playing rugby versus going out on date night with your partner versus, you know, helping a child with a skinned knee. I love that, John. Yeah. I, one way that I've come to think about this and then I've got a, a partner in who thought that up this with me, Jim Young, we, we came up with this idea of the arrow and circle man, uh, which I think gets to what you're saying. Like it's harmonizing the feminine and the masculine, and it's right there in the masculine bathroom symbol. You know, the the, the symbol of Mars with the arrow pointing up to the right, yeah, in yeah. a circle. And like we've been only about the arrow for thousands of years, you know, and we ignore this other part of our humanity, as you're pointing out, like the need to be caring and to connect. And and the you know when you talk about the wussification of men, like it takes real courage to talk about emotions and when Absolutely. and to be vulnerable. Uh, which Brene Brown has, has spoken so well of. Yeah. Um, it takes uh, a lot of courage to be willing to to um, opt out of some of the the domination um, games that that mm-hmm. men play, and to sort of stand up for, you know, the least powerful around, and to kind of get in, you know stop a bully, say, um, as opposed to just go along with this idea we're going to be you know uh, king of the castle and make fun of those who who haven't gotten to the top. So, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of, of kind of simplistic thinking around this question of how do we evolve as men? And I, I like mm-hmm. the way you're talking about, can we access our full humanity? Because the, there's so much richness there, John, right? Like it, 
when you don't just have the arrow, you, you often don't have an interior life, right? You often are also going to be disconnected from people. You don't have as many friends that we now know with, with growing amounts of research that relationships are the key issue, the key factor for a healthy and happy life. Yep. So you're going to be a, a non-wussy man and be a, a dead man and an unhappy man. You're going to yeah. choose that because you're afraid, afraid of being a wuss. Yeah. The masculine code ensures your misery. That's well, I, that's brilliant right there. <laughs> I, I mean, it's truly, I, I mean, I think, yeah. and then that's the thing that it pisses me off about this, honestly, because I see so many men that are fucking miserable and they have it all, mm. but they have no friends. They, they can't communicate with their wife. Their teenage kids are resentful and angry at them because all their time and attention is spent at work. Yeah. But they're worth $400 million. Wow. And I that think, frustrates yeah. me. Do you see change and hope? And I, 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 love to, I, I got my thought on it too, but I'm curious when you, when you look out of the culture, John, or especially with younger men, I, what, what do you see? I see reason for hope. I see the younger generation in high schools and colleges. I, I mean, I think it's split, right? I can argue it either way, but the mm -hmm. part I like to focus on is uh, there's a large group of young men that are more and more or increasingly comfortable with everything that they feel. They understand that the importance of having friendships and a healthy relationship with a partner. Um, they're comfortable telling each other, other male friends, I love you, giving them hugs. Um, and, and then I see, I mean, it's funny because it's spotty, right? I, like I remember a few years ago, I had a teenager telling me that, yeah, you know, I was trying to be vulnerable in front of my girlfriend and, and I started crying because it was kind of heavy. And she looks at me and she goes, dude, stop being such a pussy. And so I, I think just that awareness of it's not just the men policing the men, right? It's women are raised in this environment too, and they buy into it as well. For sure. Yeah, that's a... Uh a huge issue. And I, 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 we try to, in our book, acknowledge that like, this is men's responsibility to change, but women can play a huge role in, in facilitating it or preventing it. If not preventing it, um, yeah. hindering it, let's say. Yeah. When I uh, like the idea that I, I like the idea that it's, it's not our fault that we came up through the man box that, that just happens. We don't ask for it. We never chose it, but it is our responsibility to evolve beyond it. And I think one of the things that we can do and women can do and I'm, I'm, you know, kind of generalizing here for heterosexual relationships. So I apologize. Um, is I think we can both realize that women are inherently better in most cases in relationship than we are, because we are not socialized in that direction at all growing up. In fact, I would argue that we're mocked and humiliated most of the time for dipping our toe in those waters. Mm -hmm. And women are socialized in the direction of relationship, connection, nurturing. And so I think oftentimes, like when I'm doing couples counseling, I'm giving more weight to what the female's saying and her perception of reality, because I know that typically the man is locked in anger and is externalizing most of the blame mm, interesting. and isn't as evolved in those soft skills that she is. Yeah. And I, if I apply that to the workplace realm, which I know better than, than that, you know, the mm -hmm. personal realm where you, where you have such expertise as, as my co-author does, that's what you just described helps explain why women are, are thriving as leaders when they do get uh -huh. to be leaders because they, uh, they have that wider range. They've had to learn the game of being the hyper-masculine boss and be tough, but they also tend to still have those relationship skills or often do still, um, and they're they're able to to work in this world that's more flatter, faster, and more fairness focused is another way of, I've kind of yeah. thought about where things are going, and that often requires a little bit of vulnerability. It, re it requires a um, emotional intelligence to be able to read emotions and and know how to respond. And uh, if guys want to thrive in the world that's taking shape, they do need to get those soft skills. And yeah. you, maybe we can re reframe them as success skills. Yeah. My, my co-author's uh, wife, Marilee Adams, you know, helped helped us coin that little term, but because that's really what's called for these well, days. And and I think we need this. We need to consider marketing, you know, and the use of phrases, right? Like maybe we call those skills rock hard cock skills. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to think of how do you appeal uh -huh. to the man box man. I'm I'm half kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. 
<laughs> um, where was I going with that shit? Oh, I, I think you're right that I think women are better suited to be leaders at this point because they have a they have more access to a broader suite of skills, and I, I think they there's a distinction I make between gender and sex where gender is masculine to feminine and that spectrum and sex is male to female and that spectrum. So what that means is, especially for a lot of women in business, they've learned to be more masculine because they need that to survive. They need those skills, but then they also have access to the feminine. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a masculine woman or a feminine man or anywhere in between. Um, but I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, I, I, that's, I think that's a good point. Um, yeah, it, it, it seems to me that we are starting to realize more and more people, I think, are realizing that, you know, this is going back to that hope question. And I, I see it in some of the, the best workplace leaders that I, you know, got to write about and, and interview and connect with, like the head of Cisco, for example, um, is uh, Chuck Robbins. And, you know, he he just embraced some of these things that we would consider more feminine. Uh, when he took over as, as the CEO role several years ago, he had a dream that he uh, was in a homelessness camp in, in um, San Jose near the Silicon Valley headquarters of Cisco, the big tech company. And he, in the camp, he saw in the dream his, his, the face of his father and his pastor. And the next morning he woke up and said, like, I just have to do something about this. And he made, he called, you know, the city officials in charge of homelessness issues and said, well, how can we help? Um, and so he immediately made sort of philanthropy a key part of his leadership, which has typically been more, you know, we just, just tell us about the bottom line and, you know, that all that do gooder stuff, not part of the, you know, pr real performance. Right. Um, plus he was leaning into the intuitive, the, the, soul, yeah, the yeah. dreams, right. And for him to take that seriously and to be public about it, 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 it kind of ignited a firestorm of philanthropy and, and throughout the company so that the entire company, all the employees started doing more and they, their efforts just kept like a, a like a flywheel of, of effect of, of feeling better about themselves. And, and as a company, they rose in, in the great place to work rankings in the, in the course of this work. So there are leaders doing that. Another example is the head of PwC, the consulting firm and accounting firm. He took a call during the, the COVID time frame in his daughter's bedroom uh, so, you know, a lot of leaders were having to kind of lean into their humanity, but he's yeah. like, okay, I'm on a Zoom call. I'm in my daughter's bedroom. And during the call, he acknowledged that mental health challenges had touched his family. And for this leader of one of like, you know, 55,000 employees or something like this, you know, company in charge of money issues to acknowledge vulnerability in his own household around mental health, that just is, is speaking volumes of the way that guys are cracking open. Mm -hmm. or breaking out of that that man box we we call confined masculinity and and sort of acknowledging the fuller humanity yeah it was interesting i was just doing an interview this morning actually with dr elise cortez who does meaning she brings meaning and purpose into corporations and she was saying that you know in leaders she's looking at intelligence emotional intelligence pretty standard and then she also has added spiritual intelligence and she said mm -hmm. a lot of these high performing innovative companies the leaders have really embraced these spiritual elements. And to me, that makes sense, right? That the CEOs or leaders are always operating in an imperfect vacuum of information. Like they, you can't get enough, you don't have perfect information in order to make a decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're always kind of trying to gather as much information as you can and then make a calculated risk decision. And okay, so you're gonna check an astrological reading or you're gonna check a dream. I mean, you know, I think there's, it's whatever, avenue you can use to get another little nugget of information that might apply. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I love that. Yeah. I think that's a growing area and it's, and that's one of the reasons I would, I've been drawn to this teal stuff. And, and to, to be clear, like the teal world is, is a little separate from the great place to work world. A lot of my research that when okay. I was there was heading in that direction, but great place to work is not quite uh, embracing this teal stuff. I think it's a, a, a you know, step away, you might say. Uh, but that's actually why I did leave Great Place to Work. It was it was a great place to work, but I, it wasn't quite ready to embrace this stuff. Mm. Partly, I think, over that fear of the woo-woo, maybe. Uh, but also, I think it's more a little more comfortable with some of the traditional reporting structures, whereas Teal is really interested in, in shared decision-making and distributed power, uh, really challenging these traditional hierarchies. So, um, But going back to your point about the, the spiritual knowledge piece, 
I think you're right. And I think there's, you know, the, the latest science suggests that like when we, when we achieve states of like meditation, like you were getting at earlier, John, like we have access to, to understandings and insights that we wouldn't otherwise have. So why wouldn't we tap that world and that, that yeah. element of ourselves and, and the, the deeper connections we have to the collective unconscious as, 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 I, as Jung might put it, or, you know, other quantum intelligence or however you want to. Yeah. Exactly. It's there. You know, we, we don't, we may not understand it fully, but, you know, including uh, with all the research on psychedelics and, and their ways of, of people accessing deep, uh, like firm beliefs that we've seen the deeper connections, like, you know, there's something going on there that, that we can tap. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've lived long enough. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the scientific paradigm. And I also have lived long enough to know that it can't explain everything. It's one paradigm. Yeah. And, and I'm always going back to that. That's my foundation. But I've, I've also lived long enough to realize that there's more going on in this world. And there's other paradigms to explore that might address other phenomenon a little bit better. Yep, for sure. Um, I, I think that uh, the more we step into these, these practices of contemplation, of meditation explore, explorations with 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 some of the psychedelics and how they can be therapeutic. Besides um, expansive, I, I'm reading Michael Pollan's book, How to Change uh -huh. Your Mind, right now, and I, I know some Great friends book. that have gone on some of these medicine trips, and they've been incredible, like super powerful in terms of transforming lifelong anxiety uh, and, and giving people a lot more hope. I'm considering doing some of this this work as well and taking some of these these medicinal medicinal trips both for anxiety that I've wrestled with, but also because I'm drawn to that spiritual uh, access. Uh, that I and, and this is another thing that men historically wall themselves off from, John. Like the research shows men are a lot less interested in spirituality or, or so, at least somewhat less interested in spirituality than women are. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, a, what an impoverished life that is if you are going to just poo-poo that and, and focus on the material your entire life. Yeah, I, there's definitely more going on in this world than what I can sense with my five senses. That's yep. for damn sure. Yeah, yeah. In fact, my eyes don't even work that well anymore, so I'm maybe down to four and a half cents. <laughs> oh, no. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. And, and maybe Thank some you. other, you know, the, the intuitive or the uh, other kinds of senses may take well, off. Exactly. That's, I mean, my thought is, okay, what am I not seeing or what am I supposed to see differently? So that's how I'm trying to make meaning of it. But mm -hmm. um, so turning to masculinity, because I want to get to your book a little bit as well. So how do you talk about traditional masculinity? Because that's kind of a perilous phrase in this day and age. Yeah. And I sure as hell don't want to go to toxic masculinity because I don't think that helps any of us. We had the same idea, John. We were trying to understand how to, yeah, what are the light, what's the terminology we're going to use as we think about the shift underway? Um, and we did sort of see it you know, try to keep things simple. The notion of the con the conventional traditional masculinity, we, we ended up calling it confined masculinity, which is similar to that box idea. And it really stemmed from uh, some psychological theories that came out of a, a Japanese psychologist who talked about the, the, ex the confined and the expanded self. We, we uh, and I'm not going to get the, the psychologist's name right at the moment, but um, it, it was an unhealthy, the confined self was an unhealthy version of the self. And the expanded one had much more uh, vitality and it was a, a fuller life. We didn't want to have expanded masculinity because we felt that sounded too much like an erection. So we went for <laughs> liberating <laughs> masculinity. Bad, <laughs> now, that kind of, you know, we, were, we were heading on that path pretty long, John. Like, um, well, we went with liber liberating masculinity uh, to signal that it's about a, a freeing of yourself. To, Can to, I jump in there though, in terms yeah, of ahead. confined or restrictive masculinity? I like those yeah. phrases and it makes me think of, you know, if you take a piece of paper and you fold it many times, that has, it has that feeling to it, like a confined mm. definition of self. And it's in each of those folds in which the shadow, <laughs> the shame, the guilt, the fear, the anger lie. I love that. Did you just come up with that just now? The folded paper? Mm, I did. All right. I'm going to, I'm taking this word paper out. There it is. <laughs> Here we are. Um, that's a brilliant, it's a brilliant analogy. Uh, and and the, our, our book in some ways came out of the APA new guidelines on, mm -hmm. on healthy masculinity. That it created a huge firestorm. Big firestorm. And, and Ed Adams, my co-author, was 
on the front lines of that. He was on the US, he was on today, uh, what are some of the morning shows with with um Michael Strahan, for example, and Laura Ingraham on Fox, like because the, the findings of those were like if men adhere rigidly to those traditional guidelines of stoicism, competitiveness, aggression, um, self-reliance, they become on they live unhealthy lives. They have higher rates of the, the problems like uh, the medical problems and shorter yeah. lifespans, suicide, addiction, life loneliness, all that stuff. And so it, it, sh- it shouldn't be in some ways controversial, right? But, you know, we got that big backlash, but that's where we were. That was a big genesis for our book was to say, let's, how can we get to a healthier place? And it's not just the realm of our own health, but I, we tie things to the planet. Like if we don't have a more uh, enlightened version of masculinity that sees the interdependence of the world, we are going to burn ourselves up or blow ourselves up. When you can argue that traditional masculinity looks at women just as they do the planet. You dominate, you take what you want. You don't worry about the consequences. That is really well put. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, you know, that is actually a, a, a road into, I think, uh, a better version of masculinity too, is to point out like, you know, can you, do you really want to have your, your, your wife or your daughter or your mother treated in that way? And then there can be a defense of the traditional thing. I'm going to protect her and so forth. But if you kind of push a little bit further, they're like, do you really want to treat them like they are infants? as opposed to adults like you and me, like why should they have less power? You know how powerful they are. You know, mm-hmm. they're probably more powerful than you in some ways, you know? And so I think there is a, there's an avenue there. Um, but I think a big part of it is, is helping guys see that that traditional masculinity and just asking them, it, it, how is it serving you? You know, you, you talked with Alex uh, the other day. Terranova, uh, yeah. With a beautiful conversation about men talking about, the pressures they felt, what was hardest about being a man? And Alex talked about a hike where they were saying, it's just so hard to be a provider and to, to, to be a successful guy. And I think if we raise more of these conversations, I've been having them with my friends and, and, you know, wider circles as well. And so often men don't really understand what they are called to do individually. We, we, those pressures of how we're supposed to show up as that money guy uh, and the strong man and the ladies man, you know, that really gets in the way of us being who we would be otherwise naturally or organically or in terms of what our spirit is, is called to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it hamstrings us on a number of levels. And, you know, the biggest ones I concern, I'm concerned about is happiness and relational satisfaction. Because mm-hmm. um, we seem to be doing okay in, you know, the workplace, like we can make money. But, you know, again, we don't find a whole lot of meaning in it usually. And we lack self-awareness, so we don't really know what we feel. Yeah. And I want to, I want to challenge that a little bit, John, because yes, we've guys have, have done better than women overall in, in the workplace, but most people at work, including most men are not satisfied or they're, they're disengaged. Right. Yeah. And, and they oh, are, yeah, that's definitely true. Like the Gallup information. Yes. The Gallup information oh, absolutely. On, on disengagement. And what, what, um, what you find is that those workplaces are, are structured according to a hyper-masculine culture. Yeah. They're, as we've been talking about the command and control stuff, there's no room for emotion uh, or intuition or spirit. And that kind of infantilization of those in the lower rungs of the organization, which is most guys, most people is, is very toxic to the point where it shaves lives off years off our lives. Mm -hmm. Jeff Jeff Pfeffer of Stanford has done this amazing research on how we have like a hundred thousand, 120,000 extra deaths a year because of this kind of management where, where people are, they don't have any control over their jobs at work. They have insecurity over their jobs at work with this kind of ruthless kind of layoffs at, at, at you know, at the, at the slightest drop of trouble and slightest, slightest, slightest sign of trouble will lay people off, you know? And, and so all this contributes to a pretty unhealthy experience at work for most guys, yeah. even though to your point, I mean, maybe you were getting at this idea that, well, we can earn a living and we can maybe do better than women have. It's not, it's what? far from ideal. Yeah, I think you nailed it with your first statement of we're doing better than women was kind of my thought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously that's true with the gender, the pay gap. And um, so, yeah, where do you see us evolving? I mean, you kind of touched on that. Where, like, specifically how, and I I know it's hard to be prescriptive, but Mm -hmm. what are the general trends, I guess? 
I think that uh, the role, for one thing, we think about roles and relationships uh, with, that are sanctioned under the two, under that confined masculinity. And I think where we're going with this liberating masculinity or this arrow and circle masculinity, I think men are, are seeing that they can be caregivers in addition, in some of the roles they can be are caregivers. They can, that could mean raising kids more actively. And there's really neat research that men during the pandemic who are staying at home more have identified more fully as dads you know, when they are dads and they don't want to go back, they've really kind of, you know, fused that into their identity. They're who wouldn't, I mean, they're their kids and they're coming to realize I love you, you know, uh, and it's challenging, but, but there is a change in identity that's happened during the pandemic because of the work at home. So caregiving, um, but also things like spiritual seeker, like we were getting at a little bit earlier, like, can you, can you make space for exploring the matters of spirit and soul? Um, uh, potentially also um, the new kinds of relationships that we can get into so that we can be re- relating to each other as um, from a place of emotional vulnerability mm-hmm. and, and face-to-face male friends as opposed to shoulder-to-shoulder so that we can actually look at each other in the eye, ask, you know, really understand how we're doing and be honest about that stuff, including, you know, warts and all. Um, so I, and that's, that includes a, a closer relationship to ourselves. It's like, who am I? What am I really feeling? The self-awareness piece that you're getting. Um, so I think if, if we, one way to think about it is this, we have more roles that we can play and we have new ways that we can relate to each other uh, and that are going to be, and one other part of that relationship stuff is to be collaborative besides competitive. We, we grew up so much in a, in a sea where we're swimming in competition, John, but we don't have to always be fighting. <laughs> we can be seeing each other as, as brothers and, and collaborators besides yeah. competitors. Yeah. Beautifully put. Um, and I love that you brought in that uh, shoulder to shoulder versus face to face, that change in dynamic, because mm-hmm. my, the work I do typically is and was face to face men struggle with that. Yeah. And so for some of my more difficult clients, usually, you know, like teenagers back in the day, I would actually take them out to a park and do something with them side by side. So they wouldn't have to make eye contact. Yeah. 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 Um, So, yeah. And I think, you know, when we were hunting back in tribes, that's how we were with shoulder to shoulder. I'm glad you mentioned the tribe stuff because that's a piece of this puzzle that really animates me, John. And I'm not sure if you, if you explored that with Alex and the other conversation I heard, but the idea that, most of our time as human beings was as hunter gatherers. So like our DNA is really our natural makeup is shaped by a hundred thousand years, roughly of being foragers. And, and those communities um, were shaped by ad- three attitudes or three, three kind of central attitudes. According to the research I've looked into it on this gratitude, a bun- uh, gratitude, autonomy, and egalitarianism. Hmm. And, and when, and I, when men are in, were in those, Communities and, they, and when they were when anthropologists have studied some of those tribes that have not been touched much by civilization as we know it, the men tend not to be super aggressive or dominating. They are much more living according to those things. We don't boss each other around. That we have autonomy. We aren't having extreme differences in wealth and, and status. Um, and there's a sense of abundance. Like the the earth did give enough back then. Mm-hmm. It, it, in some ways, it still does. But we have. With the rise of agriculture, you started having scarcity. You had the more dominating folks came to, to the top. In some ways, it, that's a simplistic view, but we can see there was a there was a Garden of Eden back yeah, then yeah. for male and female relationships and for men as, in general to be. It wasn't a nasty, brutish, and short life back then. The yeah. research has kind of busted that myth. Oh, awesome. So let me ask you this just on a personal level, on a vulnerability level. So how is I, I'm your... sorry, I don't do that stuff, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you meant Fair to say enough. shit. I don't do that shit. I don't do that um, shit. Right. <laughs> so how has your personal evolution of masculinity gone? And where have you stumbled? In a bumpy way, I would say. Hey, would you, we're going to say something more there? Just where, you, where have you stumbled? I stumbled on tax day this week, John. Uh, I did my taxes with h and Block, who I've done for like 20 years. 80% of the time, 90% of the time, I've had a refund. Been pretty conservative. This year, I was a little more risky, and I have a $15,000 tax bill, Oof. which is at least $10,000 more than I expected. Um, 
and it really it's it hurts and it's in it hurts at these psychic levels too about being a man who's a failure a financial failure like how come i how come i'm not in control of my of our family finances as the main guy doing this stuff um and for a day or two i just was like uh, really hit by that at that masculinity shame level um but thankfully i've you know learned enough about this stuff written about it to like climb out of that spiral uh, sharing it with people including my wife and realizing okay there's it's, it's not totally in my control like my my son started college a week later than he should have he, well if he had started college a week earlier he would have been a dependent maybe that would have given him a big tax break his yeah, school yeah. started in september as opposed to august which some do <sighs> my youngest turned 17 and i didn't realize that cost you a two thousand dollar child tax credit so there's this these things that are just a little they're comp it's complicated it's complex and uh and if I looked at the bigger picture, we are in a society where my wife and her profession as an artist isn't recognized, isn't valued, but I don't, I don't subscribe to those values. Like we would be in much better shape financially if she was compensated, like, you know, a VC, you know, or mm -hmm. investment banker or somebody and look at down the street, the guys at Silicon Valley bank just lost billions of dollars. And I actually feel bad about a $15,000 tax payment. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on writing about this too, from that perspective, which is also cathartic for me. So I would say like, I'm making progress and I still stumble uh, regularly, you know, in terms of navigating these, these, these old poles to feel the, the man, man box pressures. You, you could yeah, say. And thank you for sharing that. And it fascinates me because I think one of the man box rules is we're only as masculine as our latest achievement. Right. So as soon as we fall down, as soon as we get fired, as soon as we have a huge tax bill, as soon as we, I mean, there's a bunch of ways you can go. Get, if someone breaks up with you, all of a sudden it gets related back in our minds to our masculinity. And I, I like, I, I remember after I got divorced, I got a vasectomy and I wanted it. Like I didn't want any more kids. Yeah. And there was like 12 to 24 hours afterwards where I had this, these thoughts in my head of, am I less of a man? Right. Because now I can't have babies. Yeah. Even though I didn't want any babies, I'm, right. in my mind, I was too old for babies. But the yeah. thought still comes. And so I make the distinction between first, first voice, second voice, mm. where the first voice is just that primitive amygdala, emotional kind of troll fucked up part of your mind, which is always there. <laughs> and you can't uh -huh. stop that. You can't stop that bastard from talking. But you, I would argue, the more true you, the core self is that second voice. And so yeah. to recognize yeah. that as, oh, that's the first voice just talking shit to me. Mm -hmm. And then you come up with the second voice and say, you know what, John, relax. You're okay. You're still a man. You don't need that sperm anyway. You don't even want it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. If you, do you know about that work of Phil Stutz uh, and his tools? Phil Stutz, the psychologist. Oh yeah. Yeah. On the, uh, the he had the Netflix special, the Netflix special. I, yeah. With Jonah really Hill. Great stuff. Jonah Hill's yeah. guy. Um, I just was reading some of uh, uh, Stutz's book and he's got this cool thing about shadow, which reminds me of what you're saying here, John, that, if we can, he has this idea that if you can move your shadow out in front of you and I have it look like a person, yeah. like what is, what are the features of that, of that shadow? And then can you connect with it and, and, and speak out to, to the, the world with it? And I did that in the wake of this financial thing. And I was like, okay, I, that shadow looks like a naive, um, kind of disorganized, uh, you know, uh, skinny guy. You know, and, you know, weave in the, the strength piece in there. And there was when I was able to kind of embrace that in the positive scene of it, it was like, there's something wise about the naivete I would have, like, which is to say, like, I don't care that much about money. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't believe in this cap, the system we have in the mm -hmm. ways it values certain professions way more than others that I, that I consider yeah. more meaningful. So it, we're, you're supposed to connect with the shadow and turn to some other audience and say, listen. And, and there's something kind of strong and powerful about doing that. Or I found that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a way to take some of those first voice impulses even, or maybe it's not the same as what you're saying, but something about the thing that we are ashamed of and incorporating it into us that can make us healthier. Well, and I think that's, largely what internal family systems is about where, you know, you take, mm. like, I could also say that that voice that's saying, oh, you're less of a man is my inner critic. And so I can say mm. that's a piece of me or a part of me 
And I can have conversations with that part of me in an attempt to come to terms with it, make friends with it, have it be heard, and then ultimately have it switch roles because that's a role it doesn't really want and never really mm. asked for, but it took on in order to protect the whole of you. Interesting. I just want to thank you for doing Inside Out, dude. Uh, what a like killer movie. Can we have the little boys version next? Like, is in some ways that would be a really interesting segue. Yeah. That, you know, have you have you have you thought about that? Well, I just had a small part in it. I just consulted and gave them information on anger and anger management and okay. how the brain works in relation to it. But uh, you know, I did go back and do a little bit of work with Paul Ekman, who's the world's leading expert on emotion, and. We were trying to get his Atlas of Emotions, which is an amazing tool that he developed for the Dalai Lama, mm. into some of these. There, there's a few efforts going on to create social, emotional, and ethical curriculum yeah. for everyone in the world. Yeah. And I remember I talked to, uh, I think it was Tulane, and they were super excited to have the tool and bring it in, but the whole conversation got scuttled Um because someone who was involved, their emotions came up ironically. And mm. I think they needed some like, more control, um, wow. which I, I was confused by. Um, that doesn't sound very but we were going to use those inside out characters in that curriculum. And I was like, brilliant. Like it's because yeah. that movie's given a whole generation of people a new vocabulary and a new awareness in terms of what's going on inside their head and their heart. For sure. Yeah. I, I'm just I'm thinking aloud. It just, it would be interesting to, to show young men and older men what operates within us because I think it, it's a brilliant it, idea. It's like a black box otherwise. And we, and we don't want to look in, in it, but yeah. you had the movie was such an, an invitation to explore this stuff. Well, I think, honestly, I think most of us men are scared shitless to go inside. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the biggest hurdles. Because some of the, what you start seeing is stuff that we are told is shameful, right? Like yeah. fear and and um, sadness, maybe concerns were weak, you know, or yeah. sadness. I know for, I had a heart attack uh, about two years ago, John. And one of the interesting things in the wake after I talked to a counselor for a while was like grieving part of my childhood and and realizing that my dad's really p bad temper was had scared me pretty badly. And had yeah, probably set the stage for some anxiety. And I just, she said, you might have to grieve your childhood. And, and it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like, holy crap. I have been walling off this sadness and, yeah. and shame around God. Cause you don't want to be, you don't want to identify yourself as a scared kid. Cause who want, what guy wants to acknowledge that he was scared. I, I don't want to identify as an anxious adult, but I went on the radio and did that. Ultimately I was like, part of, part of my makeup's depression, part of it's anxiety. Well, kudos for doing that because we still, yeah. And that, that stuff makes, gives permission every time one of us does that, I think to, yeah. to open the door open a little bit more. And, and I think that's part of what gives me hope is that there's more and more people out there that are giving other men permission to feel whatever it is they're feeling. Yeah. I love it. So let me ask you this. I, I got to wrap up, but where can people get a hold of you? If they want to know more, where can people get a hold of the book? You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Ed Fraunheim. You can also go to edfraunheim.com. Uh, my, my website, it's got some services there and more ways to connect. And you can find the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, happy to give talks, workshops on some of these topics. And uh, yeah, I, I am really, this is a mission of mine to help guys free themselves and, and live fuller, healthier lives. And that usually means everyone around them has healthier, fuller lives as well. Absolutely. Well, and I, I love you and I really appreciate the hell out of the work you're doing. So thank you. Love you back, man. Looking right in your face. <laughs> thank you so much, John. Look into my good eye. Um, so, anyway, <laughs> so that is it for this episode of The Evolved Caveman. If you like this episode, please be sure to rate, review, and share. If you didn't like it, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 